We've got to do the pupillary reflex. We've got to do visual acuity, uh, the 6-6 chart. And, and we've also got to do fields. And I do fields, first of all, by the technique called direct confrontation, um, which uh, I will uh, do perhaps if we get some time towards the end, because I've been told by Hannah we've got to have a bit more OSCE-ish uh, stuff. Okay, so we've got uh, light reflex and fields to do as well. Then, of course, when we come to three, four, and six in a moment, we're concerned with the light reflex as well, because light goes in and, and it, uh, the, the, the uh, ciliary muscle contracts. Uh, so that's part of it. You can't separate two and three. But we've also got eye movements to, to talk about in a second. This is very much uh, likely to. Please, can you demonstrate in six minutes uh, the second, third, fourth, and sixth cranial nerves starting now? Okay? Nod, nod, wink, wink. Are you happy with that? Because that's the sort of thing I've seen in the neurology bay. So now let's on to the ocular motor nerve, which, is a, which for me is a very important uh, neurosurgical nerve. One of the things that you probably don't realize is that as a patient develops a rapid rise in intracranial pressure before we get on to eye movements, one of the things that neurosurgeon, as in a hematoma, extradural hematoma, uh, bleeding inside the head after a head injury, one of the things we look at is the dilating pupil on the side. So if I get a left extradural after being banged on the head, caused by bleeding from the middle meningeal artery with a fractured skull, then the pupil, as I start to become deeper and deeper, close to a coma going down, the, the ocular motor nerve gets pressed on, it becomes paris, as it were, temporary neuropraxia, and the pupil starts to go bigger and bigger. And that's a classic neurosurgical sign that everyone should know about, I hope. And of course, the light reflex, not only is the pupil getting bigger, but the pupil is getting sluggish on that side in response to light on either side. So you get a sluggish pupil, and then eventually the pupil becomes fixed and dilated as the third nerve is being compressed indirectly underneath the temporal lobe so much. So that's one aspect of day-to-day -day neurosurgery. We don't bother to test eye movements in that situation. The patient's unconscious and going downhill. But we do look at the pupil size. Okay, so let's go on, on looking at the ocular motor. We're still in the midbrain here, okay? Um, there is the aqueduct, the cerebral aqueduct, and here are the ocular motor nuclei, and we've talked about the edinger westphal nuclei being nice and near. Just so happens we're at the edge of the substantia nigra uh, area for uh, dopamine, the crust cerebri there. Nice simple little uh, diagram, really. that's not very uh, complicated. And there we've got the ocular motor nerve. Now, what does the ocular motor nerve do? Well. I think it's easier to think about that in terms of eye movements. This is, what does it do? To think about what it doesn't do. So the sixth nerve is a dead easy nerve. It, it's applied, supplying lateral rectus. The fourth cranial nerve supplies superior oblique. We're coming to it in a moment. And all of the rest uh, is uh, ocular motor. So medial rectus, uh, inferior rectus, superior rectus, or uh, ocular motor, OK? If you have some lesion, which is, say, come on slowly, I'm not thinking of a head injury example, but something like a tumor uh, pressing on the third nerve, um, or an aneurysm, uh, which actually is often a posterior communicating aneurysm, because that's what, you know, where the third nerve is, then the patient develops, number one, a ptosis. So this person, is uh, the doctor, as it were, is lifting up the lazy eyelid. Number two, the uh, pupil is dilated compared to that one. Because she's got lovely dark brown eyes, we can't see that. And also, what I can see is that this eye, she's being asked to look straight ahead, this eye is slightly pulled out. It's abducted at rest by the unopposed uh, action of the lateral rectus, which is the healthy sixth. So because she's got a sixth, which is healthy, the lateral rectus working, and the medial rectus is weak, she's got a slight abducted, affected eye. Why do you get the ptosis? Anyone know? Yes, sir. Ocular motor innervates uh, the muscles responsible for it. The ocular motor innervates also the muscle called the the beta pathway superioris. Good. That's true. So you get a ptosis. 
And then all over in a side question. Why did you get a partial ptosis, nothing to do with ocular motor, in a Horner syndrome? Why do you get a little bit of a droopy eye in a Horner syndrome? Because the eyelid is unusual in having both striped muscle and smooth muscle in it. And it's the sympathetic from the superior cervical ganglion, incidentally, that actually allows a little bit of droop when the sympathetic is affected, as in an apical tumour from the lung, which is a so-called pancose tumour. So um, the patients that I've seen with Horner's, by and large, have had a gloomy prognosis because they end up, uh, on x-ray, having a, a cancer of the apex of their lung where the superior cervical ganglion lies. So that's another reason why you get a ptosis quite apart from the, uh, the, 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 the ocular motor. So we, here we've got the lateral rectus, that's number six, cranial <coughs> nerve, uh, medial rectus, um, yes, that's uh, three, superior rectus, superior oblique, we're coming to in a minute, inferior oblique, that's also ocular motor. So the, the ptosis, the dilated pupil, and the slight abduction of the eye are the classic signs of an ocular motor palsy. Now, the trochlea, the fourth, it's called trochlear, by the way, I think a nice bit of Roman Latin here, here because the, 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 the little pulley it goes round is called trochleus or trochlea uh, in Latin. And because the, the muscle goes round the pulley, not the nerve, the muscle goes round the pulley, um, here it is here, and that's why we end up with it being called the trochlear nerve. Now, I find this nerve in terms of a palsy to be a very difficult nerve to be sure about. Um, how do you actually test fourth nerve function? I'm not very good at it and I don't think I know. But I can tell you, I know when the patient's got one, and the reason is they tell me, if it's come on slowly, and it's usually of, of rather malignant significance, that they are, they are getting double vision when they are going downstairs. So diplopia on going downstairs, looking at where your feet are, is classic of a fourth nerve palsy. And the other thing, although this looks a little bit of an older person, if this was a little four or five year old uh, child with, with, with a, a tumour that was causing a trochlear palsy, they all get head tilt. And why do they get head tilt? Because the child learns by tilting their head, the, the, the images which are like this straighten up. So they get this head tilt, uh, which paediatricians know about as a fourth nerve sign. Okay? Um, I think that would, that's all. Uh, what does the nerve, what does the muscle do? It does this intorsion, and that's because it, it pulls the, the, the uh, globe of the eye down and in. So it's pulling it down and intorsion, a rotary movement. Very strange type of movement, isn't it? Thank God for the eye department, because we can send them for a so-called HESS, H-E-S-S, like the, uh, the chap who landed uh, uh, in, in, in England, you know, trying to convince us not to go into the Second World War. Rudolf Hess, he ended up in prison, didn't he? Um, anyway, the Hess test, I don't know, no relation probably, uh, helps us to define which muscles are weak. So we send them down, if they're complaining of diplomacy, to have it analysed. We're, we're lazy. Okay. Three, four. Now, the next one. Uh... <coughs> oh, five, 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 four, six. Would it be nice to have had six? I get it. We'll come back to. Shall we go on? On to. Yeah, that's it. I think it's two. Do... Let's do six before five. And when we look at um, this man here, who's being like the lady with the third nerve palsy, this is a very easy nerve because. Here we've got the medial rectus pulling the globe inwards as he's looking ahead. Um, and the patient gets more diplopia when you ask him to look out to the side. And the law of diplopia is, by the way, the diplopia, the double vision, is greater in which the line of the muscle normally would act. So you get, if I've got a, a left lateral rectus weakness from a six nerve palsy, I'm asked by the doctor, look straight ahead, do you see one or two images? The answer is two. Are they up, up or down or side by side? Here, with a six nerve palsy, they should be perfectly side by side. Because there's no reason why they should be like that. 
Now tell me, as you moving your eye, are, is the double vision, we'd use diplopia, wouldn't we, um, getting worse? And of course the answer is it does, as you're trying to move in the direction of...